grab a seat. You can grab a seat. Thanks for being here this morning. I, I would tell you to open your Bible up to 1 Corinthians, but I've already told y'all we're taking a break uh, for a couple of weeks and dealing with some other things. Again, thanks uh, for joining us, for all the folks who are online. And man, we've got uh, in our church, uh, pretty much as always, but there are just a lot of situations that have affected people, um, you know, just individually and things, reasons people uh, are at home for all kinds of different reasons, uh, hurts in the body over this last week, all kinds of things. And so for you guys who are joining us online, uh, we love you guys, we're thinking about you, we're praying for you, and we hope that you're encouraged and challenged by joining us uh, today also. A couple announcements really quickly before we pray and get into the Word together today. Uh, first one is this. This coming Sunday, we are joining with uh, New Hope Pregnancy Care Center. We're a participating host uh, for a walk for life, okay? And again, it's not even too late now if you want to raise funds with them to assist New Hope Pregnancy Care Center. Uh, they're right here in Bradley County, uh, working with at-risk and crisis pregnancies in our county. And then also, even if you don't feel led to help them with fundraising, you're welcome just to jump in on the walk. That's a part of advocacy, even if it doesn't contribute to the funds uh, for the ministry. So that's going to be 9 o'clock, meet here at the church this coming Saturday, and we've got about a mile uh, loop that we're going to make in the neighborhoods uh, right here beside the church. Next thing up is a reminder uh, for the parents of our children that our Sea Kids ministry is active again as of today. Now our classes are limited right now as we start back in a limited manner. Uh, even the classrooms themselves, we've put caps on the number of students in those rooms uh, just for the purpose of safety and security security and all those kinds of things. But right now in this season, our children's ministry is specifically for age one and up uh, to second grade, okay? Um, and so just make sure that you're aware of that. You have any questions, you can hit up Rachel or Kelly, Rachel at chapelcleveland.com, Kelly at chapelcleveland.com. Hey, and by the way, I said this before, but I, but I want you guys to know that we will open up and create classes as we can, okay? And right now we still need classroom teachers you know, to make that possible. So our, our children's ministry will be what we can offer, okay? Uh, and otherwise, I want you to remember, this relates to the message today too, your children are always welcome in here. They are always welcome in here. They are not a bother. They are not a nuisance to our church. The next thing up is youth ministry. And this is a reminder that our youth ministry is now gathered here at the church, meeting in the youth room. It's a big room uh, up in the children's hallway, right, right inside the entrance. Uh, beside the parking lot, and that is 6th grade through 12th grade. They're meeting at 6.30 every Wednesday night here in the youth space, and they had been outside for a long time until this last week. They were excited to be back together. Okay, I think that's all I have by way of announcements. I hope you got your journals and pencils and pens. I have even more notes than normal for you guys, so happy Sunday, all right? Uh, why don't you bow? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to minister to you as we join together for worship. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fall in this place. I pray that you would fall upon the people who are not able to be here with us in person. I pray that your Holy Spirit would fall and that you would be sovereign over everything, every word that is spoken, everything that is uh, heard, everything that is discerned, everything that is interpreted, that the feelings and intent of our heart, our actions, uh, everything, Father, be sovereign over all of these things. And Father, I pray that, um, I pray that you, would, you would cause your church, not even just at the chapel, but you would cause your church to be a radiant bride. You would, you would produce in your church this, this image and picture, even in all of, our, all of our sinfulness, all of our humanness, that you still produce something in us that is good, that is lovely, that is uh, evangelistic, that, it, that is uh, a, a bearer of your image in the culture around us, and that some of these things that we touch on in the next couple weeks will be a part of that process. And so, Father... Would you refine us as a church? Talking about the chapel. Would you, would you refine us as individuals as a part of this corporate body? Would you uh, renew us? Would you change hearts and align them where they need to be aligned with your word? Would you break hard-heartedness? Would you reveal areas of deception? Would you stoke the fires of love in our hearts for others, even others that do not look like us or think like us or act like us or, or, any, or in, you know, seemingly or anything like us, yet 
at their very core, they are also created in the image of God. Would you make us a discerning, truthful, loving church in every way? Father, we thank you, and we know that these things are only possible by the presence and the work and the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, the title of the message this morning is Life in the Gray, Being a Pro-Life Church. I think there are a couple things that kind of provoke this idea, and I think ultimately the Holy Spirit is behind it, or I wouldn't even be doing this, okay? But we're right in the middle of 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, as we've talked about for weeks, what is probably the largest continuous section in Scripture that deals with what we tend to call a lot of times gray areas. And when you throw out a lie or throw out a term like pro-life, a lot of times, and, and there are, there are gray areas in, you know, inherent in this term when you talk about the idea of being pro-life. And in fact, one of my greatest I don't know if you want to call it a fear. I'm not standing up, in, uh, up here in front of you today fearful, but my, my hope in this is that even when you hear the term, that you won't necessarily harden your heart like one way or the other, but that God will allow you to listen and to take in all things because I'm trying to approach this in a holistic manner, and there are just all kinds of, we'll, we'll just say this. Somebody said it to me like this when I met with them on Friday. Uh, when we were talking about the content of what I'm going to deal with this week and the content of what I'm going to deal with next week, they're like, bro, there's trigger words in there everywhere. Trigger words, right? You know, like if I were to make a series of Facebook posts on this, there's no telling what would pop up, what would be screened, what would be not allowed, what would be fact-checked, what would be this, what would be that. You understand what I'm saying? Like there's all kinds of trigger words that are, that are here over this week and next week. So my prayer for us as a body is just simply that we would listen all the way through, even if there is disagreement on some of these things. And I've stood up in this pulpit, well, maybe not in this pulpit, because we've only moved twice right now in three years, in the three different pulpits that have been a part of our church in three years, I've told you guys, we have to talk about everything in the church. There is nothing that we cannot talk about in the church. We can't stop avoiding things that may cause conflict. We can't stop talking about things that maybe even we don't agree about in the church. The church has to be a place where we deal with things openly and transparently, even at the risk of disagreeing and hurting each other's feelings. And ultimately, above all those things, we have to realize that we are co-heirs with Christ, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, that we've been adopted into the same weird, squirrely, hard-headed, obstinate you know, family together as children of God, as adopted sons and daughters. And so we have to be able to talk about everything, even the hardest things. And I've told you as parents, I gave you the PG-13 warning last week, but again, here it is again, so you know we're dealing with things that may create some conversations in your households if you've never had these conversations. But I will say this, if we don't talk about it in the church, it's going to be talked about in the culture, yo, right? I mean, tell me that's not the truth. Tell me it's not going to be talked about in schools. Tell me it's not going to be talked about in sitcoms. Tell me it's not going to be talked about in cartoons. You understand what I'm saying? T tell me that's not wrong. These things will be taught in culture should we not talk about them in the context of a loving group of believers and with God's word serving as a filter, even at the risk of disagreeing sometimes? What do y'all think? That's what we're doing, man. That's, that's what we're doing. And we will not stop. We, we will not move off of that spot. Now, that being said, when you get into some of these topics, are, is there a possibility that I may say something where I may get out of line somewhere and some opinions may creep in and things like that? What do y'all think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I'm a human being just like you guys are. Now, I, I will promise you this. Even as I ask for latitude and even as I ask for grace to be able to deal with some of these things over the next couple weeks, I will also tell you this. I promise I've prayed. I promise I've studied. I promise that I've considered. I promise that I've thought about the conscience and the heart of people in the church the conscience and the heart of people out of the church, the conscience and the heart of white people and black people and other people of color, the conscience of the heart of people that have money, the conscience and the heart of people that do not, I promise you I've prayed, I promise you I've studied, and I promise you that I have considered, okay? 
That's the only promises I can give you at that point, all right? And then it's up to you to discern if I'm being genuine in that or not. There's one other thing before, I, before we want to jump into the deep end of the pool, and it is a very deep pool today and tomorrow, is I want to say this. As a part of the consideration of dealing with a topic like this, I have intentionally decided not to throw out a bunch of numbers and statistics at you guys, okay? And when you deal with a subject like abortion, would it be very easy to, to deal with a whole bunch of numbers and statistics? What do you think? Certainly, okay? Now, caveat, if you're interested in numbers and statistics, the two general places that most people pull their statistics from when they write articles and present things and stuff like that is they go to either cdc.gov or they go to what's called the Guttmacher Institute. And I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's G-U-T-T, Guttmacher. And that's where they pull most of their statistics from. So here's the only statistic that I'm going to present to you today because God has put this on my heart to, to say before, almost before we say anything else about the subject, okay? Uh, statistically speaking, almost 24% of women have had an abortion before they're 45 years old, all right? And what that means is that more than a quarter of our households have been affected because, remember, there are possible fathers who are involved in this as well. And so there's no telling what statistic of people in our culture in some way, shape, form, or fashion have been affected, participated in, whatever you want to call it, by the process of abortion, statistically, it's a much bigger number than I even realized before I started doing the research. Now, why do I present that number? It's not to shame us as a culture. It is to acknowledge that there are probably people sitting in the room right now who, are, who were possible moms who had abortions and who maybe were husbands or boyfriends or whatever who were a part of that, that union as well, who abortion has touched in this very room. And here's the thing I would say before you say anything else. You are not excluded from the commonwealth of the grace of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? We are not saved by our works. We are not excluded by our works. Our salvation is by grace through faith alone. And there is nothing that can take that away. And there's nothing that you could have done in your past that if you have taken everything of yours to the foot of the cross that could exclude you from the greatness and the, I'm going to use a, like a, 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 a word that's not a word, the bigness of the love and the mercy and the grace of God. Amen? So even as you hear these things, and even if these things maybe touch you in a way that they don't touch some others who have not, been, who have not personally interacted with the topic that we're going to talk about today, I need you to understand how God would have this, um, how God would have this affect you will be to point you back to an understanding of how big the grace of God is on your behalf and how great the sacrifice of Christ is. So all that being said, what are we dealing with this morning as we talk about being a pro-life church? And I want to remind you that as we deal with being pro-life, this week and next week is not just going to be just singularly about abortion. It's going to be a bigger topic about that. That's why you got to allow some room as we kind of flesh this out and develop it. But first and foremost, let's just say, what is by definition, what is abortion? Well, it is the willful, the purposeful termination of a pregnancy. It's the willful, the purposeful termination of a pregnancy. So with that defined, what does it mean? What is the foundation for people being pro-life if we want to use that term, even though it calls to mind all kinds of things and different things for different people? Well, here's the deal, and here's probably your first note today. The foundation of a pro-life position, according to God's Word, is what we know as the Imago Dei. The foundation of a pro-life position is what we know theologically as the Imago Dei. Now, what does Imago Dei mean, folks? Y'all talk to me, class. It means the image of God. The Imago Dei means the image of God. Here's where it comes from. Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created created 
them. This is the Imago Dei, the fact that every man, woman, and child, I'm going to say it one more time in case you didn't hear it, every man, woman, and child carries with them an imprint of the image of God. You are an image bearer of the creator of the universe. You understand what I'm saying? And ultimately, this is where we have to trace our identity back to as all people. All people. And that means that our identity transcends a whole bunch of labels that we put on things that have to do with how we regard each other in a pro-life sense of the word. We can't let other labels be the primary thing. The primary thing for us to truly be pro-life people is that every single man, woman, and child, without exception, is an image bearer of God and therefore has the same inherent Value, dignity, worth before God, no matter any label. You understand what I'm saying? So if you're taking notes and if you want to write it down, here's another way to say it. All of mankind is created by God and in his image, we as a church. Because right now, I'm not trying to lecture everybody in the free world. I'm, I'm called to pastor this church. We as a church, when I ask myself, what kind of church do we want to be? What kind of person do I want to be? It comes out like this. We admire, respect, and honor the image of God in every single human being. That's the kind of pro-life person I want to be. That's the kind of pro-life church that I would like to be a part of is one that admires and honors and respects the image of God in every single person. There are no labels on that statement. There are no exceptions on that statement. Not even when you talk about uh, religion. Not even Christian or non-Christian. Every single person, very exclusive, bears the image and the imprint of God. Now, this is part of why this conversation is so difficult right here. Here's, here's where you get into some of the difficulty of this. Because I think what I've said right now would be hard to argue from a Christian context, to be quite honest. But here's part of the deal about why this makes this so difficult. It's because because you are born as an image bearer of God, you have a very powerful and cunning enemy. You do know that, right? It's not even so much that the devil hates you. Who does he really hate more than anything or anybody else? He really hates God. And what do you bear, right? What do you bear? Talk to me. You bear the image of God. Therefore, logically speaking, what, what's the problem? He hates you. He hates you. He wants to kill you. He wants to deceive you. He wants to destroy you. He hates your guts. And will do anything he can to twist, manipulate, destroy in any manner he can. Why? It's because you bear the image of God. You have a very powerful, you have a very hateful enemy. Now when I go back to the question, and this is inherently again why the, you know, the, the outworking of some of these things, the application of these things are like so difficult. It's because, uh, you ever heard the phrase, somebody actually was asking about this the other day. You ever hear the phrase, the devil's in the details? Okay, like for most people, what I've given you so far, everybody would be like, for the most part, you would get 100%, not completely, but 100% in the churches, amen, you know, <laughs> what I've heard so far, everybody value worth dignity, amen, okay, devil's in the details, y'all, because there's a lot of details that go into us really being a pro-life church, and to be frank, I think what's going to happen over the next couple weeks and the risk maybe that I've actually kind of prayed against is that some of the things that I'm going to tell you guys as we kind of, as we flesh this out, some of them y'all are going to hear and some people are going to say, well, that's a really conservative way to think about things. And then you're going to hear some of you guys that identify as conservative, in quotes, you're going to hear some other things and think, well, that's a really progressive way to think about some things. Or your inner voice may say, well, that sounded really liberal, Okay. Like, that's the kind of thing that's going to be going on in the minds of hearts of people as we talk about some of these things. And to be frank, after thinking through this whole process and what all's at stake and everything that's going on in our culture and all the division and media and this and that and the sides that we're taking and election season and all that kind of stuff, the, the devil's in the details. 
And I think he's going to pray on these things. And I think we are going to hear things. Well, just to be frank, I think if we don't reach the end of the next two weeks and some people thought, well, that sounded liberal and that sounded conservative, I probably didn't do a real good job up here. Okay? That's, that's kind of what I think is I probably didn't handle it very well and left some people or at least tempted to have some of those thoughts. So let me ask you a question. As we talk about the idea of what kind of church would we want to be, are we really pro-life? Do we really see every single person with equal worth intrinsic value um, because of their, their marks bearing the, the fingerprints of the creator. Let me ask a simple question. Would we as a church or you as an individual, would you welcome any person into this place? Would you welcome any person, no matter what, into your presence, okay, into time spent with you, into a situation where you had to engage and interact and things like that? Could a person come to our church that's maybe not dressed exactly like us? Can a person come into our church of a different race, of a different ethnicity, of a different social class, speaking a different language, uh, with a disability? Could a person come into our church uh, from any place in society, any culture, any background, and would we make them welcome? Now, I'm not even dealing with would they feel welcome, because a lot of times that, that part of that is on the other person as well. Y'all do understand that, right? You can't necessarily make every single person feel welcome because they bring in their own like thoughts and tendencies and interpretations and uh, even prejudices and all that kind of stuff. But would we, as a church, have the desire to make every single person, no matter you know, the, the, the labels that we would assign make them feel welcome. Well, that's a, that's a question I want to roll around in your head for the next couple of weeks. The obvious answer to the question, at least my hope is, is that we would all aspire to that end, that we would make every single person feel welcome and that we would judge every single person through that lens of the Imago Dei and the value that they have because of the creation and that they carry with them the image of God. So here's the next question as we really get into the details and we talk about abortion this week. The question is going to start out like this, and I'm going to start out very foundational because we got a lot of different generations in this room. The question is, okay, even if we're pro-life in the sense that we value every single man, woman, and child, what about the unborn, right? What about the unborn, okay? D does this apply, does the Imago Dei apply before birth? I think that's just a foundational question that some in this room need to know the answer to. Well, to answer the question, I would start, obviously, with Scripture, Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16, a passage that's going to be very familiar for most of you. Here's what it says. For you formed my inward parts... You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. In your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. This is speaking of God's activity in life before birth. Jeremiah says something very similar. I think it's Jeremiah 1 5 where he says, before I was born, you knew me, okay? You had plans for me. You already had purpose for me before I was even born. These are things that are very true, scripturally speaking, is that life happens before birth. I believe that is a very, very clear scriptural teaching. In my mind, it appears to be very black and white when you look at the scripture. Therefore, what does that mean? If life does start before birth, then in the context of adoption, the Ten Commandments apply and rights and values apply to the unborn child just like they do to the born child, okay? Now, do y'all see where that division is in the abortion debate? The question becomes, does the unborn child, and I'm choosing that word. Y'all hear the word I'm using? Okay, unborn child. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. The question becomes, does the unborn child have the rights of, you know, of, an, of a person, of a mom, of a dad, of, a, of another person who, who is on this side of birth. Well, the idea is, if Scripture teaches that God is inherently involved in the activity before birth, if life does happen before birth, then therefore the rights and the commandments do apply to the unborn child, which means, Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not, what? 
Thou shalt not kill as life. And therefore is equated scripturally with murder. Okay? It is equated scripturally with the, with the willful taking of the life of another. Okay? That, that is the logical sequence, the conclusion here. And I would also submit to you guys this, that I, I just want you to remember, the Lord is the one who opens and closes the womb, right? Okay? So from a theological perspective, from, from a church perspective, and I don't expect everybody, oh, uh, hear me on this. I do not expect the world to hear and receive and understand everything that I'm up here sharing with you guys. I'm sharing on the foundation of Scripture, not logic or academics or whatever. I believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. I believe that this is truth, okay? But it doesn't mean that people of the world are going to receive this as truth or understand where our ideas come from. I'm not claiming that. I'm not going to be able to win everybody over in the case of an argument, but in the church, we, we need to understand these things. So life begins before birth. God is involved in that life. That, that, that unborn child bears the image of God. It already has an enemy in Satan who hates that child because they bear the image of God even in the womb. And then theologically speaking, every pregnancy has God's fingerprints on it. And I'm saying that one exclusively. I'm saying for the believer, for the non-believer, doesn't matter. Every single child in the image of God and it's the Lord that opens and closes the womb, right? You see that all throughout the Old Testament. You see that in the New Testament as well. You see the barren whose wombs become active and fruitful. You know, you see others that maybe don't have children. It is God's business, pregnancy, children, family. This is God's business. His fingerprints are all over it. And therefore, the laws and, and, and his standards and statutes apply even to the unborn child. Let me answer another question that some of you guys have already squared away long ago, but some of our younger people are going to be asking that they need to have answered. The question is, what happens to the soul of these unborn children? Okay, What happens to the soul of these unborn children? Well, let me say this exceedingly clearly, first of all. Okay, Scripture does not speak directly to, the, to this matter. All right, there, there it is in black and white. Scripture does not speak directly in black and white words to the soul of children, meaning that we have to rely upon the sovereignty, the goodness, the graciousness, the power, and the mercy of God to provide the answer to the question. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, but here is what I would tell you from an inference standpoint. So I'll give you an opinion based on what I think Scripture says in just a moment. I think the Scripture is already up on the screen. 2 Samuel 12, 22. Uh, basically what's happening here, for those of y'all that don't know, David and, and Bathsheba, they committed adultery. But even in their sin, the fingerprints of God allowed for a pregnancy. And that child had God's fingerprints on it. And while that child was... You know, you know, was in the womb. Let's just say this. The child gets sick. Um, David mourns. He fasts. He weeps. He, he's, so, he's so broken up and so focused on prayer for, this, for saving this child in sickness that he, he's not even functioning on a day-to-day -day basis right now. The child dies, and all of a sudden he hops up. He hears the child is dead. He hops up out of this, this place of deep prayer, and he goes and he takes a bath. And he anoints his head with oil, and he sits down and eats some food. And his friends are like, what is wrong with you? While the child was alive, you acted like a dead man. Now the child is gone, and you act like everything's okay? And here's what he says. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live, but now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. David's interpretation of God's character was that that child would be in heaven, okay? And that he would go to him when his days on earth were complete. All right, so let me just tell you what I believe. I believe according to the inference of what we see here in Scripture, and I believe according to the goodness and the greatness and the sovereignty and the power of God that the souls of children are gathered to their maker. Okay? That's what I believe. 
Can I point you to a black and white? Absolutely cannot. Wouldn't do so. Never want to mislead you. That is what I believe based on what I know of God and based on what I know and see in the Word. Okay? That's the best I can answer the question. Now, we got to get into the weeds. Okay? Now we got to get into the weeds. Let me say something that's going to be very striking, especially with how I've started so far. But I want to be very, very clear. We're going to get into some abortion history. And I want to show you what I think is a connection into the Scripture that I believe that doctrine or that, that abortion is what we would call a doctrine of demons. Okay? And I want to show you this, where this comes from. And I also want you to know, you know how I told you like I studied? When I tell you I studied, that means I didn't just go watch somebody else's sermon on abortion or read a book or something. I, I've been reading books, but I started out in the scripture and doing research. Uh, I came to this conclusion years ago. Um, matter of fact, I was probably like arrogant about it. I probably thought, oh, I figured something out that nobody else has, okay? But at this point, I recognize I'm not the only person who has made this connection in Scripture. That was out of all my pride and lack of humility, okay? Years ago, just studying through the Old Testament and seeing some of the things I'm going to show you now, it like hit me in the face one day, like this is a doctrine of demons, and then at some point, I understood that other people have, have seen that as well, okay? So you're not going to hear this all the time, but you are going to see that other people believe this, agree with this as well. And so here we go, 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 10. This is Josiah's reforms, where the king of Israel is destroying all the idolatry that was gathered up into the people of Israel, and he's tearing down uh, these idolatrous altars. 2 Kings 23, 10, he also defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, so that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire for Molech. Now, what does it mean, pass through the fire? Well, it mean, they were sacrificing their children on the altar. They were making burnt offerings out of their children in order to appease and to call for this false god, Molech, uh, to answer their prayers. Molech means king. This is one of the false gods that the people of Israel adopted um, the worship of. You see the same thing in Jeremiah chapter 32. They built the high places of Baal that are in the valley of ben Emmon to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I had not commanded them, nor had it entered my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. In Jeremiah, the context of that is this is actually one of the sins that God prompts Jeremiah to speak of when he lets them know that they're going to be taken over by foreign people and they're going into captivity. You understand what I'm saying? Like, in other words, this is one of the straws that broke the camel's back, so to speak, okay? This is, this is one of those that they were allowing, they were taking their children and they were adopting this practice of pagan religions. And this is very, this is what, this is over so many pagan religions in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, some of the questions that some of y'all have been asking for years about the goodness of God and the character of God according to some of the things that you've seen in the Old Testament, the answer to some of those is he was trying to keep his people from becoming like this. They were so reprobate that they were burning their children for the sake of calling on these false gods. Now here's the connection in terms of it being a doctrine of demons. 1 Corinthians 10, 19. Right, right here where we're going to be in the next couple of weeks. What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to become sharers in demons. Yeah, the idol is nothing but wood. The idol is nothing but stone. The idol is nothing but iron. The problem is there are demons behind the idols. And their desire is the desire of their father, okay? It is to steal and kill and destroy and to mar the image of God and to do everything they can to attack the character and the nature and the personhood of God. And if they can do it through this false idolatry, that's one of the ways that they're going to practice. If they can do it through atheism, they'll do it that way. If they can do it through religion, they'll do it that way. They'll do it any way they can through their deception. And I want you to understand, the enemy, um, one of his names is the accuser. One of his names is the deceiver. He does it through deception. And the deception, y'all need to understand now, 
The deception of the enemy is not always just overt and easily recognizable, right? Like if somebody was going to spring an attack on your household, they're not going to walk up outside beating a drum, you know, and announcing their presence that they've arrived at your house, right? The thief is going to break in and steal and kill, and he's going to do it at night. He's going to do it under the cover of darkness. He's going to do it in secrecy. He's going to do it in silence. He's going to do it not by always presenting things that maybe are overtly out of line with Scripture, but he's going to twist, and he's going to manipulate, and he's going to... And the sign of depravity, I think, that we actually see in our culture right now is that in some ways he's not even having to be covert anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like in a lot of ways in our culture, he's not even trying to be covert anymore because the the hook has already been set in the mouth of the fish, so to speak, right? The worm has no purpose any longer. But at least at this point, still in the church in a lot of ways, it's subverted, it's twisted, it's manipulated so that you take the lie with the truth. Now let me build an argument, and this is going to be full of holes, okay, because you can't do this in the time that we have. But I'll give you enough so that you can go do the research on your own. I'll give you enough. If you don't know it already, and some of you do, but I'll give you enough so that you can go do the research on your own. I am building the argument that abortion is a doctrine of demons. There are demons behind this practice because these children bear the image of God, and the enemy hates the image of God, and his desire, according to Scripture, is to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm building the argument that abortion is built on a legacy of deceit and lies, and that the, the deceiver is the one who builds these lies. Okay? Remember connection, the doctrine of demons? Let me show you what I'm talking about according to history. And again, you can go do the research. A lot of you guys know this, but who is essentially the mother of Planned Parenthood? Come on, talk to me. Yeah, it's Margaret Sanger. Okay? It's, it's Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger, this is a historical figure that if you do not know her name, you need to go research her and you need to go read about her, okay? Margaret Sanger is essentially the mother of Planned Parenthood. Margaret Sanger was also an advocate for something that's called eugenics, all right? Eugenics is essentially selective breeding, okay? Essentially, eugenics is selective breeding. It is selecting what some people think of as desirable characteristics and trying to reproduce them in a higher rate in a population. Now, what does that cause to come to mind for us, church? Like, what do people normally think of when they think about that process? Can y'all tell me? They think about Nazi Germany, and they think about the Holocaust. That's exactly what you need to be thinking of. Because it's the same thing, it's just subverted a little bit, and it's given with something under the guise of compassion, but it's kind of like the worm on the hook. The compassion is the worm, the hook is the eugenics, and the things that are behind it, okay? Margaret Sanger was a believer in eugenics. Um, She, I mean, just to be quite frank, she was a racist, okay? Abortion is a racist practice. When she looked at the population of the United States, she thought that black people needed to be breeding less. She thought any character, any group that was impoverished needed to be breeding less. She didn't really think of people well with disabilities, okay? She had all kinds of groups that did not fit her selection of desired characteristics. And the answer to the problem was that those people do not need to be allowed to reproduce, That was the answer to the problem. And this is the birth of birth control, okay? This is the birth of birth. Richie, are you telling me birth control is a sin? I didn't say that. I'm just telling you guys that if you look back at this, she was a huge, she was pushing birth control. She was pushing uh, eugenics. She was pushing abortion as a manner of birth control. Now, you can look back at the history, and you can say, well, she died before abortion was legalized. If you read the stuff, you also know that it was her work and it was her advocacy that allowed for the legalization of abortion. And again, Planned Parenthood proudly claims to be 100 years old. I think they claimed their birth was in 1916. They were always working towards this end uh, to to end up in uh, the, the advocation of 
any manner of birth control, including abortion. And again, I'm not going to get into statistics and all that kind of stuff. Interesting note about eugenics. This is where I might get lost a little bit in the weeds, but, you know, uh, again, a little, a little bit of levity. I'm trying to challenge y'all to think as well. Uh, even on some of these things, if we disagree, I at least want you to be thoughtful. I want you to know that I've looked at myself in the mirror and I have asked myself if I really believe what I believe, okay, on all these things. And you need to challenge yourself in the same way. Uh, eugenics, the practice of eugenics or selective breeding, the ideas go back like uh, maybe a couple thousand years. The, the ideas were not originated by Margaret Sanger, or by Planned Parenthood, by Hitler, or any of those people. But do you know who coined the term eugenics and who really did some, some groundbreaking work on trying to bring it into a modern culture? Uh, guy's name was Francis Galton. He's a younger cousin of Darwin, okay? Y'all see any connections there? Is there any connection behind uh, evolutionary theory and some of the things that we're talking about right now, okay? Now, I'll just put my cards on the table here, just, just for the sake of letting you know I'm not trying to mislead anybody. I am a young earth creationist, okay? I do not judge you if you're not a young earth creationist, if you're an old earth creationist. I don't sit in judgment over you. I, d I don't think this is a non-negotiable in the sense that we can't be in the body of Christ. What I'm challenging you on, and you can go back and listen to messages I taught back in Genesis when we did that book, and you can hear me flesh out why and all that stuff. Even though I've got a background in a secular university, you know, I'm like a class away from a biology degree. I've sat in the classrooms and done work on comparative vertebrate anatomy, like looking at transitions from species to species. I've sat in the academic setting under that teaching. Like, I know it. I recognize it. I, I know it's about, okay? Uh, but that being said... I am afraid that one of the, one of the uh, consequences of us adopting evolutionary theory in the church is the dehumanization of people. In other words, you are, you are plasmodial ooze, you know? You are proteins and, you know, synthesis and, you know, DNA and things that kind of gobbled together and just happened to get, like, struck by lightning and, ooh, life. You know, I see Frankenstein in my, you know, my mind right now. Like, you, you are this, you are this, you're, you're a fish, you know? You're, you're, a, you're, you're a snake with legs. You know, you're, you're, you're an ape, you're a monkey. I, I think, I believe, personally, that there's some dehumanization that has come along with that so that we don't recognize the imprint of God, the Imago Dei, in each other. I think, and again, I said think, I think that is one of the consequences of evolutionary theory in our society is we look at people as less than human and we don't even know it. Like, we don't even know it. Okay, so again, I'm not talking about a salvific issue here. I'm not, all right? But I am challenging you to go back and, and investigate and see if maybe this has affected our view on the, on the Imago Dei, the imprint, the expression of God on others, all right? Now, let's talk about the lies that are inherent in this practice, uh, Margaret Sanger, the eugenics movement, you know, things like this. Uh, I've already identified them. One of the lies is that this is really compassion, okay? Um, and, and I'm not going to tell you that Margaret Sanger was, like, mean, you know, that, that in her mind, she was all about killing and death, okay? But, you know, the thing is, if compassion is based on a lie, what is it still? It's still a lie, right? It's still hurtful. It's still deceptive. It still has, there are still consequences to the ideology. So I can't speak for what Margaret Sanger was thinking, Okay, but I can look at the ideology and I can see how even if it was presented in a, as, a, as an idea of compassion for the poor and for people that didn't feel like they could support themselves or their children or whatever the case may be, it's still a worm, it still has a hook, and still the outcome of it is death and death and death. The other thing that's a lie about this is I, I did not hear, I had never heard of the word eugenics until I was over 30 years old. You know that? I had never heard of the term eugenics until I was over 30 years old. I am an educated man, even though I do not sound like it. I know I don't sound educated, okay? I went to school. <laughs> I, I went through public school. I went through public university. I have a master's degree. That doesn't make me anything special, but in Calvary Chapel, that makes me a unicorn, all right? Only those of y'all know Calvary Chapel know what I'm talking about, all right? 
I am an educated man in public academia. I knew about abortion. I knew about civil rights. I knew about birth control. I knew about Planned Parenthood. I knew about all these things. How come I never heard about eugenics? Because nobody wants to talk about it. If you go to PBS and look up the profile for Margaret Sanger, which is essentially presented to us as an American hero, you will not find the word. Why? Because we don't want you to know where it came from. Oh, it's okay. I just accept that maybe that was the beginnings of it, but we don't believe that way anymore. Okay, right? You know how I heard the term eugenics? I heard the term eugenics from a very young very conservative. He's actually, if you want to talk about politics, he's a libertarian now. He's like, government, get away from me. <laughs> right? I heard the term eugenics when I was 30 years old from a very young, very conservative black man who hated the idea of abortion. He's the one who told me about it. Not a book, not a teacher, not a website, not a news article, not a pastor, not anybody else, because he had done his homework. There's lies in that. There's deception in that because there's covering of it so that we don't have an understanding of where it came from. The next one, when we talk about a history of lies that you guys need to know about, from you're like, I didn't know I was going to history class today. I'm sorry, all right? The next one is a guy named Alfred Kinsey. I'm just curious here. How many of you guys have no idea who Alfred Kinsey is? Just raise your hand. Let me see. I'm just curious. Okay. The vast majority of the room. Do y'all see why the, this is what I'm talking about, y'all? Put your hand back up. How many of y'all have no idea who Alfred Kinsey is? Put them up. Come on. Up. Look at this. Look around the room. This is part of the problem right here, y'all. Okay? Alfred Kinsey is essentially the father of the sexual revolution. Are you hearing me? He, he's daddy to the sexual revolution that happened in like the 60s and 70s. He published two reports called the Kinsey Reports. I think one came out 1948, another one came out 1953. He was a researcher at Indiana, or, sorry, Indiana University, and he published. He was like the world's first, here you go, sexologist. Any of y'all studying for that? Do they have that degree at Lee? Okay. I'm sorry, sometimes Richie just comes out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he was like the world's first, what we would call sexologist, okay? He did all this research, and when I say research, like I don't even want to talk about the details of what he did. It was jacked up, all right? I I'll just give you one for instance. He published all kinds of findings that he called research of hundreds of acts that are pedophilia and then drew conclusions about sexual ethics out of them and we find out in hindsight that he based it all on accounts from a guy who was a serial child rapist who abused hundreds of children over the course of his life published it as research, and nobody asked for 40 years, how did you find these things out? Where did you get your information from? You have hundreds of responses to sexual behavior in kids down to like two and three years old. How did you examine these things? Where did you get your findings from? How did you observe these things? Nobody asked for 40 years. And these reports became the foundation for what our culture believes about sex. Go do the research. Don't take my word for it. Be a Berean. Look back into the Word. See what it has to say about sex. Go back and do the study. Read about him. I wouldn't go read the reports if I were you. I did not read the reports. I'll just tell you that much because I don't want to know. I read about the man. I read about the methods. I read people pro, you know, pro and against. Some people, again, if you go read the PBS little biography on Alfred Kinsey, they're not going to mention the hundreds of acts of pedophilia from 
you know, a convicted child molester that he presented as statistical evidence. They're not going to tell you that he based most of his research on accounts from prostitutes and rapists and convicted sex offenders for most of his research. I'm not going to tell you that. Didn't say that on the PBS side. Alfred Kinsey, if you want to talk about the lies, here's the lie that came about with the sexual revolution. I confronted this when we walked through 1 Corinthians 6. I challenge you guys on this. The lie that came about through uh, his reports is this. You are an animal. That's what it is. Now, nobody's going to say that. But what it means is you are a slave to your sexual needs. You're an animal. You respond to your animal passions. And anything that tells you not to is old-fashioned, outdated. Religion, morality, you're an animal. That's the lie. Now, I want you guys to understand, you, you do understand that ideologies have consequences, right? Like whether good or bad. Good or bad, right or wrong, okay, indifferent, ideologies have consequences. In other words, ideologies, ideologies produce behaviors. Scripture would say this, doctrine produces deeds, okay? That's the scriptural equivalent to this idea that ideologies have consequences. What was the ideology, okay, of uh, super, I'm sorry, what, what were the consequences of this, these ideologies, ideologies, specifically, you know, the, the huge proliferation of birth control, the absolute ability to procure an abortion, the, the legalizing of abortion, and then uh, the sexual revolution undergirded by Kinsey's work that led to the idea of we, we just simply respond to our animalistic desires for sex, no matter what it is. Like nothing, nothing is off limits. There are no moral grounds for the constrainment of our sexuality. What, what are the consequences of those things? Well, I would say the biggest one is this, okay? This is my opinion. This is an opinion statement. I would say the biggest one is this. The result of these things, the consequence of these ideologies, is we have divorced sex from family. We have divorced sex from marriage, and therefore we have divorced children from households with a married mom and a married dad. And as evidence, if you want to go do the statistical research, go back and start looking and see when the family broke down in our country. And I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about, because we're going to deal with race, you know, next week as well. I've already told you, uh, abortion is a racist practice. The birth of it is racist, and the practice of it is racist. Go do the statistical research. It's right there in black and white, okay? That was not a pun, all right? It's right there. You can go see it. You can find it very, very easily. Okay? These things are based on lies. They're based on racism. They're based on, in my opinion, evolutionary theology that we are, that we are animals. You can go back and look in, uh, especially the breakdown of probably the black family. Okay? Um, go back and look. I mean, civil rights era, like mid-1960s, and I'm not saying it's all this. I'm not trying to oversimplify um, but the rate, from my understanding, the rate of the two-parent household in black America in the 60s, like before the Civil Rights Act, was close to 80%. Now it's around 20%, okay? These things all were very closely tied together, all right? The, the rise of Planned Parenthood, the undergirding of the sexual revolution based on Kinsey's work, the breakdown of the family, I mean, I'm not an expert, but it seems like if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, what is it? It's a duck, man. It's a duck. And a lot of other things are misdirection. Here's another thing I would point you to in terms of lies and deceit and things of that nature. I want you to think about this. I'm going to provoke you more with this next week than I am this week, okay? But I'm going to give you a taste of it this week. The rise of what we would call political framing, political framing and the dehumanization of babies. 
All right, let me ask you a simple question. Do words matter? Yes or no? Do words matter? Yes. Words matter. The meaning of words matter. The manner of communication of words matter. Words matter very greatly. Just think about these terms. Pro-choice. Pro-life. Anti-choice. Anti-life. Pro-abortion. Anti-abortion. Okay? Like things like that. I remember I've got a, I've got a friend on Facebook um, who would have called herself for a very long time a progressive Christian. And she was talking about who most of us will call pro-lifers. But in her, in her Facebook post, she chose the term anti-choicers. And I remember thinking in my mind when she said that, I went, ooh, like, ooh, man. Like I felt the knife go in my back when you say that. You couldn't even call me a pro-choicer. You had to call me an an- or a pro-lifer. You had to call me an anti-choicer. And I said, would you want me in return to, to post a comment uh, to the anti-lifer, right? Do you see how the choice of words matter? Uh, what if we say abortion instead of the definition of what an abortion is? I've purposely not done that. I, haven't, I didn't bring videos today and pictures and a description of processes and a whole bunch of statistics because my goal is to educate. My goal is to uncover deception. My goal is to break down hard-heartedness, Okay. My goal is to have us respond in truth and in love, right? Like injustice and also compassion. And what I don't want to do is arm a bunch of you guys that have always considered yourself pro-lifers with a bunch of stuff that you can go out and use as hammers on everybody else around you in the culture, right? And we got way too much of that going on right now. We got a bunch of people out with hammers instead of armed with both truth and compassion going out into our culture and telling them about Jesus in a different way and how God has given them meaning and how God has given them his imprint, his expression on their lives, right? We got a lot of people that want to be right instead of a lot of people that want to be reconciled. We got to deal with all of it. We got to deal with all of it. You know, you talk about these terms pro-choice, pro-life, and I'm telling you guys that I believe this whole practice was born out of deceit. Um, if you go online right now, I would be willing to bet, I, and I did this, but you may find something different when you go and do your searches and stuff like that. When I started researching these terms, pro-choice, pro-life, you know, uh, po- politicization, you know, of words, this, you know, this idea of political framing and stuff like this, y'all need to be aware of how, how big of a deal this is right now. It's marketing is what it is. It's, it's literally marketing. And anyway, there's a book um, that I read years ago. A guy, guy's name is David Capellian. It's an interesting book. It's called The Marketing of Evil. Well, I read this one book that I felt like relatively obscure. You know, I don't know that many people that know of it, have read it, or whatever the case may be. This guy's a Christian, um, and he has a background in marketing. And he told a story about the advent of these terms, pro-choice and pro-life. Okay? And I read this years and years ago. Well, I remembered the description of the advent of these terms in his book, but then I took the time to go and search myself, the origination of these terms. What I found is that media, by and large, the vast majority of what I found says that the term pro-life was the first term that was used, and it was a genius marketing stroke by people who were anti-abortion to to package their ideology in a way that could best be presented to the culture. That's what I found when when I went and looked these up myself. And so I thought, wow, that is so different from the story I got from the Christian author of, you know, this book that I read years and years and years ago. So I went and found the book again. I actually had to buy it again a second time. Y'all ever have to do that? And I start looking for his account. I look up the names and I start researching and I start looking. And here's what I find. There's a guy named Bernard Nathanson that he interviewed in the book that you can go and you can find this information. Bernard Nathanson was a doctor who was a huge part of a couple of big abortion advocacy groups in the late 60s and early 70s that were foundational to getting Roe versus Wade, you know, having a certain outcome in that case in the legalization of abortion. 
you can find direct quotes from him where he says, we helped coin the terms freedom of choice and women control their own bodies. And he said they did it while they were laughing about it because they knew what they were packaging with it. They thought they were doing it for a good reason, in his words, but they coined the term freedom of choice. So quite literally, here's the deal, quite literally, pro-life was coined before pro-choice. But what was the foundation of pro-choice? It was this dude years before pro-life that coined the term freedom of choice and then they took the money they had and invested it in marketing firms and they started stamping that phrase on their marketing and on their advertisements. So in a sense, some of the research that I read when I just looked for it was right, but it was deceptive. Do you you understand what I'm saying? Do you see the difference between the two? Pro-life did come before pro-choice. Freedom of choice was the first thing that got introduced. And then they went and gave money to marketing firms to, to contextualize abortion, which is the willful termination of a life, of a pregnancy. And they did it under this marketing campaign of freedom of choice. That's where it started. Now, the reason this guy will share this is is I want you to understand something. This guy, uh, again, I forgot his name, Bernard Nathanson, he he had a change of heart over time. When the ultrasound ultrasound came on the scene, he started, he used it to actually watch abortions. And this guy actually, before he was a believer, before his life was over, he converted to Catholicism. And he was searching for salvation. He was searching for forgiveness. When he saw ultrasounds of abortions, before he knew Jesus, he changed his position. And he was uh, basically the producer of a movie that's kind of been lost years ago called The Silent Scream. And it was about children in the womb in the process of abortion. He changed his mind as a doctor when he saw what was happening. And then in his later years, he sought out forgiveness. He became an advocate for life in his later years. Here's the conclusion. The practice of abortion is built on lies, unbiblical ideologies, and racism. I believe that's the truth of the matter. This is the foundation of the practice. And we have to be aware. You know why we have to be aware? Because we're losing a cultural war. And when I say war, I don't mean it in the sense of you have to go out and oppose everybody. I just mean it in the sense of, just let me be frank, in the church, we can be stupid and uneducated because we just haven't done the work. We haven't done the hard work to know why we believe what we believe, to even be able to have good conversations with people in the culture, to be able to challenge, to be able to reject, to be able to present right? To be able to share Christ, not again, not to be right, but to be able to share the gospel in light of the things that we know to be true and how we got to where we got to as a country. So here's where we got to start to conclude. What is the role of the church? What is the role of the church as a pro-life church? Well, number one is obvious. We got to support the rights of the unborn. We believe the unborn have as many rights as the mom, The unborn have as many rights as I do as a male, as a man, okay? We have to support the rights of the unborn, and we have to support those who defend them. We have to identify and reject emotional, politically framed arguments that are contrary to the gospel. I'm not asking you to know every argument for abortion. I think there's some helpfulness in trying to understand where the other side's coming from, okay? Okay? But the better you know the gospel, the more you're going to know something that's in opposition to it, right? The better you know your heavenly father, the more you're going to know something that's not of his spirit and that's not of his nature. We have to teach a biblical ethic of sex, marriage, and family. And when I say a biblical ethic, I'm talking about the whole thing, right? I'm not just talking about that sex is dirty and rotten and shameful and ugly and produces consequences and pregnancy is a consequence. No, that's a, that's a child, right? 
in any context. That, that's, a, that's a child. There, there may have even been sin involved. The pregnancy is not the sin. The pregnancy is a child. It bears the image of God. But we have to teach that sex is good and that it's right and that it's holy and that it's ordained by God and that he gave us a context for it and the context is marriage. And with a context is marriage, it promotes a two-parent household where their kids are a part of it, where their kids can be nurtured and understood and loved and taught truth and corrected and all those things, right? And, and I've asked this question before, but just think with me for just a second. Like, you may object to everything I've said today. Just consider this question without any other conclusions or thoughts. How different would the world be for good if we simply practiced our sexuality in the context of marriage? Okay? What would happen to trafficking? What would happen to abortion? What would happen to homelessness? What would happen to foster homes? What would happen to slavery? What would happen to, just keep on going. What, how would the world be different for the good if we simply practiced a biblical sexual ethic in the way that God gave it to us? It would be a different place. It would be a different place. It would be a different world. And it would be for the good. We have to support the single mom and the orphan. This is where some of the hard-heartedness of the local church comes in. If we want to be a pro-life church, then we need to know the mom. We need the mom who has had an abortion to know that she can have fellowship here and that the gospel of Jesus Christ is good for her too. And we need the mom that, that, we, that we teach and train and inspire and exhort and equip. We need the mom that decides to stand on truth and to not have an abortion, to know that she's got people that she can count on, that maybe we can teach her how to budget and help her find a job, and that we can maybe babysit, and that we can, we can support the woman that does the right thing. Let me just say this. For a person, we as the chapel, we can't solve every problem in the world. We just can't do it. I wish I could. I get overwhelmed sometimes, feeling like I wish we could. But you know what? I'll tell you guys, you ladies that are in the room right now, okay, um, we'll, we'll put our money where our mouth is. We do not want you to run. We do not want you to hide. We don't want you to be isolated. We don't want you to, we don't want you to go, okay? We will support you through your pregnancy. We will stand on a biblical sexual ethic, and we will stand with you and your child. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's who I want to be. That's who I want to be as a pro-life person. That's who I want to be as a pro-life church. And I'm asking you guys to be the same way. We'll support the single mom. We'll support the orphan. Matter of fact, right now, um, as a church, one of our partner organizations is New Hope Pregnancy Care Center. Now, a lot of their ministry is ministering to the mom and offering options that steer them away from abortion. They're a very gospel-focused ministry as well. But then there's another uh, ministry in our town called Foundation House. Foundation House is a ministry to the mom after birth, Okay. I want you guys to know the church is not bereft of any help. That, that is an overrated idea from the culture that we have bought a lot of times, that a lot of people have bought, is the church is doing nothing. Man, have you looked at the parachurch ministries in Cleveland, Tennessee? Do you know what's happening inside the churches and in this area? There are so many resources available to people because of the work of the gospel in our community. Our community is not perfect, and it can be pharisaical. That, that's the truth, right? Yes. But there's so much work of the gospel that's being done for people of all kind, you know, kind, shape, whatever, background, everything in this town. Uh, we've got a group that's going to the Foundation House probably in the next couple weeks. They need some work done on their house. Like part of, parts of that are falling apart. They got a lot of work to be done over there. We've, we support them financially. We support New Hope financially. We're walking with New Hope for advocacy. We support Foundation House financially. We got a group that's going to be going over there and doing, doing flooring in their house in the next couple weeks. We've got to put our money where our mouth is. And you as an individual have to do the same thing. James 1.22, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress 
and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You know what I love about that scripture? Truth and compassion. That's what I love about it. That's who I want us to be. I want us to be truthful and compassionate. And if you're like most people, you kind of have a leaning one way or the other. You know what I'm saying? Like, are you a truth person or are you a compassion person? If you kind of identify as a truth person, you got to push yourself to see the compassionate and, and, to, and to excel in that direction. If you're a compassion person, you got to check yourself to make sure that your compassion is working off of a truthful foundation. We all have to provoke ourselves in that way. What's the role of the church? It's to intervene. The church is called to adopt. The church is called to foster. The church is called to advocate and to support those who do. I don't know if you know it or not, we got a bunch of adoptive families in this church. I don't know if you know it or not, we got a bunch of foster families in this church, okay? We have a lot of others that are pursuing adoption and are pursuing foster, fostering. You might think, hey, I'm not called to do that. That's okay, that's fair. What if you could help a family that is? What if you could take them a meal? What if you could watch the kids one night so they can go out on a date, right? What if you can give them, you know, just give them a little time for rest a little bit? What if you could work in C Kids Ministry where we have a bunch of adoptive and foster kids in our C Kids Ministry and you may not know that they're adopted or fostered and they may have all kinds of trauma in their lives and you may think, I'm not keeping that rowdy bunch of hooligans. Do you know where that kid came from? Do you know what they've experienced? Do you know what they've gone through? Do you know what they've suffered? Do you know? I don't know with all of them. Are we regarding them with compassion? Are we seeking to minister to them? Are we supporting the families that may be sometimes afraid to put their kids in that environment because in other church environments they've been pushed away because they don't know how to behave? Because they don't know how to sit down or sit still or shut up and listen? Would you sit still or shut up and listen really well if you're an eight-year-old who had been physically abused by their birth parents? Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. You know what we've got to understand in the church about this process of like adoption and foster and things like that? You're an adopted kid too. Jacked up, broken, traumatized, sinful, and you were adopted. And you have every right and privilege to call God your father just as those adopted children and my adopted daughter have to call me her daddy right and to be provided by me and to be disciplined by me right to be loved and to be cared for to be tended to so what's the role of the church the last one I'll give you is that we've got to repent. And you may think, well, I don't have anything to repent for. Well, I'm not saying that you did anything specifically. You know, I don't know. I, I hope something said on you today and be like, okay, i got to at least go check that. i got to at least think about that. But what we've got is a biblical tradition where as the church, we intercede on behalf of those around us. We intercede on behalf of our culture and our nation. We see that in Daniel Daniel, who was such a godly man in such difficult circumstances. He says in Daniel 9, I prayed to the Lord and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Verse 8, open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings, in which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse which has been poured out on us, along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. He says, all of Israel... Can you point to a single solitary sin that Daniel committed in Scripture? I can't. Never found it. It's not there. Okay? Now, we know he wasn't perfectly righteous because only Jesus is without sin. Like, I get it. But Daniel was a holy man. But he says, 
Israel, we have all sinned. It's exclusive. He includes himself in the sin of his people and he repents. Verse 17, so now our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications for your sake, O Lord. Let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. Verse 19, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action for your own sake. O my God, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. Let me tell you that the first thing that we've got to do if we haven't already is as a church, we need to repent for the sake of our community, for the sake of our state, for the sake of our nation, and for the sake of the church. And this is part of the process I believe we're all called to. Why don't you bow? Let me pray for us. Father God, I pray that these words would rest upon the hearts of men and women, your children in this church. Father, I pray that, um, I pray that only truth would remain not knowing where maybe I, maybe I spoke out of turn. Maybe I spoke on the authority of man, which is not authoritative, and not on the authority of your word or by the power of your spirit. I pray that you would be the one that would filter that out in the hearts and minds of every one of your people. Father, for the people who are here who are hard-hearted, truth-filled but hard-hearted, I pray that you would break their hearts for others. Father, for the people that are here that are soft-hearted and compassionate but are off the foundation of your word, I pray that you would align them with truth so that their compassion could be used for the greatest glory of your kingdom and your gospel. Father, would you use your word by your spirit to minister to each person here as you would see fit? And then would you use our church to tell of your glory to all others for your purpose and for your glory alone. In the name of Christ, we pray all these things. Amen.